So now, the next talk that we have here for one hour from 8.30 till 9.30 is the Tor Network. We're living in interesting times. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the works of Terry Pratchett, but anyways, in the novels of Terry Pratchett, there is um, this saying, and may you live in interesting times, that is actually a curse for someone that you especially dislike because it usually means that you're in a lot of trouble. So I guess we're all very excited for this year's tour talk by the everlasting dream team, Jacob Applebaum and Roger Dingeldein. There you go. <laughs> Give it up. So, um, Thanks very much to the guy who brought me a mate. I learned his name is Alexander. It's never a good idea to take drugs from strangers, so I introduced myself before I drank it. Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to say that following up after Glenn Greenwald is a great honor and a really difficult thing to do. That's a really tough act to follow. And he's pretty much one of, I think, our heroes. So it's really great to be able to share the stage with him, even for just a brief moment. And I wanted to do something a little unconventional when we started, and Roger agreed, which is that we want people who have questions, since I suspect some things happened this year that arouse a lot of questions in people, we'd like you to write those questions down, pass them to an angel, or to just bring them to the front of the stage as soon as possible during the talk so that we can answer as many of your questions as is possible. Because there's a lot of stuff that happened, there's a lot of confusion, and we want to make sure that people feel like we are actually answering those questions in a useful way. And uh, if you want to do that, it'd be great. And otherwise, we're going to try to have the second half of our talk be mostly space for questioning. So with that, here's Roger. OK, so a lot of things have happened over this past year. And we're going to try to cover uh, as many of them as we can. Here's a great quote from either NSA or GCHQ. I'm actually uh, not sure which one it is. Uh, but we're going to start a little bit earlier in the process than this and work our way up to that. So we're in a war or rather conflict of perception here. There are a lot, I mean, you saw Glenn's talk earlier. There are a lot of large media organizations out there that are trying to present Tor in lots of different ways. And we all here understand the value that Tor provides to the world. But there are a growing number of people around the world who are learning about Tor, not from our website or from seeing one of these talks or from learning it from somebody who uses it and teaches them how to use it, but they read the Time magazine or Economist or whatever the mainstream uh, newspapers are. And part of our challenge is how do we help you and help the rest of the world do outreach and education so that people can understand uh, what Tor is for and how it works and, and what sorts of people actually use it. So for example, uh, GCHQ is, uh, has been given instructions to try to kill Tor by, I mean, who knows, maybe they thought of it on their own. Maybe uh, we can imagine some nearby governments asked them to do it. Um, and part of the challenge, uh, they say we're, we're, we have to kill it because of child porn. And it turns out that we actually do know that some people around the world are using Tor for child porn. Uh, for example, we have talked to a lot of federal agencies who use Tor to fetch child porn. I talk to people in the FBI who use Tor every day to safely reach the websites that they want to investigate. Uh, the most crazy example of this is actually the Internet Watch Foundation. Uh, how many people here have heard of the Internet Watch Foundation? I see a very small number of hands. They are the censorship wing of the British government. They're the sort of quasi-government organization who is tasked with coming up with the blacklist for the internet for England. And we got email from them a few years ago saying, not what you would expect. You would expect, hey, can you please shut this thing down? Can you turn it off? It's, it's a big hassle for us. The question that they asked me was, how can we make Tor faster? It turns out that they need Tor because people report URLs to them. They need to fetch them somehow. It turns out that when you go to the URL with the allegedly bad stuff on it, and you're coming from the Internet Watch Foundation's IP address, they give you kittens. <laughs> Who would have known? So, so it turns out that these sensors need an anonymity system in order to censor their internet. Fun times. So another challenge here, uh, at the same point, one of my side hobbies is teaching law enforcement 
uh, how the internet works and how security works and how Tor works. So, I mean, yeah, their job does suck, but it's actually not our fault that their job sucks. There are a lot of different challenges to successfully being a, a good, honest law enforcement person these days. So, for example, uh, I went to Amsterdam and Brussels in January of this past year to try to teach various law enforcement groups. Uh, and I ended up having a four-hour debate with the Dutch regional police, and then another four-hour debate with the uh, Belgian cybercrime unit, and then another four-hour debate with the Dutch national police. And there are a lot of good-meaning, smart people in each of these organizations, but they end up, uh, as a group, doing uh, sometimes quite bad things. So part of our challenge is how do we teach them that Tor is not the enemy for them. And there are a couple of stories that uh, I've been trying to, to refine using on them. Uh, one of them, they always pull out the, uh, but what about child porn? What about bad people? What about some creep using Tor to do bad things? Um, and one of the arguments that I tried on them was, okay, so on the one hand, we have a girl in Syria who is alive right now because of Tor, because her family was able to communicate safely and the Syrian military didn't break in and murder all of them. On the other hand, we have a girl in America who is getting hassled by some creep on the internet who is stalking her over Tor. So the question is, how do we, how do we balance, how do we value these things? Do we, how do we assign a value to the girl in Syria? How do we assign a value to the girl in America so that we can decide which one of these is more important? And actually the answer is, you don't get to make that choice. That's not the right question to ask. Because if we take Tor away from the girl in Syria, she's going to die. If we take Tor away from the creep in America, he's got a lot of other options for how he can be a creep and start stalking people. So if you're a bad person, for various definitions of bad person, uh, and you're willing to break laws or go around social norms, you've got a lot of other options besides what Tor provides, whereas there are very few tools out there like Tor for honest, uh, uh, I, I, I'd like to say law-abiding, but let's go with uh, civilization-abiding citizens out there. And, and, and it's important to understand that this hypothetical thing is actually also true for certain values. So at our Tor developer meeting that we had in Munich recently, that Syrian woman came to us and thanked us for Tor. She said, I'm from a city called Homs. You might have heard about it. It's not a city anymore. I use Tor. My family used Tor we were able to keep ourselves safe on the internet thanks to Tor. So I wanted to come here to Munich to tell you this. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And for people who this was their first dev meeting, they were completely blown away to meet this person. Wow, the stuff that we're working on, they really actually, it really does matter. There are real people behind it. And we were all, I think, very touched by it. And all of us know someone who has been on the receiving end of people being jerks on the internet. So this is a real thing where there are real people involved, and it's really important to understand that if you remove the option for that woman in Syria, or you here in Germany, now that we know what Edward Snowden has told the world, those bad guys, those jerks, for different values of that, they always have options. But very rarely do all of us have options that will actually keep us safe. And Tor is certainly not the only one, but right now, and we hope in this talk, you'll see that we are making the right trade-off by working on Tor. One of the other, one of the other talks that I, I give to them, one of the other stories that I give to them, um, one of the, the big questions they always ask me is, but what about terrorists? Aren't you helping terrorists? And we can, we can and we should talk about, well, what do you mean by terrorists? Because in China, they have a very different definition of terrorist, and in Gaza, they have a very different definition of terrorist. And uh, in America, they're always thinking of a small number of people in some Middle Eastern country who are uh, trying to blow up buildings or something. Mohammed uh, Bad Guy, I think, is his name. Yes. That, uh, in, in the if, NSA slides. Yes. Uh, so, scenario one I want to build a tool that works for millions of people, it will work for the next year and I can tell you how it works so you can help me evaluate it. That's Tor's problem. Scenario two, I want to build a tool that will work for the next two weeks, it will work for 20 people, and I'm not going to tell you about it. There are so many more ways of solving scenario two than solving scenario one. The bad guys, for all sorts of definitions of bad guy, the bad guys have a lot more options on how they can keep safe. They don't have to scale doesn't have to last forever. They don't want peer review. They don't want anybody to even know that it's happening. 
So the, the challenge that Tor has is we want to build something that works for everybody and that everybody can analyze and learn about. That's a much harder problem. There are, very, there are far fewer ways of solving that. So the terrorists are, they've got a lot of options. That sucks. We need to build tools that can keep the rest of the world safe. And it's important really to try to have some good rhetorical arguments, I think. I mean, we sort of put a few facts up here. One interesting point to mention is that people who really don't want anonymity to exist in a practical sense, maybe not even in a theoretical human rights sense either, but definitely in a practical sense, um, they're not really having honest conversations about it. For example, this DOJ study, the Department of Justice in the United States, they actually started to do a study where they classified traffic leaving Tor exit nodes, which it's interesting that they were basically probably wiretapping an exit node to do that study, and I wonder how they went about that. But nonetheless, they came up with the number 3% of the traffic being bad, and then they aborted the study because they received many DMCA takedown notices. Yes, Apparently, they, even the DMCA is a problem to finding out answers. They asked a university society. to run the Tor exit for them, and they were just starting out doing their study, and then the university started getting DMCA takedowns and said, well, we have to stop. The lawyers told us to stop. And the Department of Justice said, we're the Department of Justice, keep doing it. And then they turned it off. So <laughs> not sure how the balance of power goes there. But the initial results they were looking towards were about 3% of the traffic coming out of that Tor exit node uh, was bad. Uh, but I haven't figured out what they mean by bad. But I'll take it if it's 3%. And I think, you know, we have, of course, I, I personally don't like to use the word war when talking about the internet. And I particularly dislike talking about it when we talk about actual issues of terrorism. And I think that we should talk about it in terms of perception and conflict. And one of the most frustrating things is the BBC actually has articles on their website instructing people how to use the Silk Road and Tor together to buy drugs. We are very, we very, very seriously do not ever advocate that for a bunch of reasons, not the least of which, which is that even though Bitcoin is amazing, it's not an anonymous currency. And it isn't the case that these websites are necessarily a good idea, but it won't be Tor, I think, that will be the weakest link. But the fact that the BBC promotes that, it's because they generally have a man bites dog. You could say that that's their entire uh, tour related ecosystem like anything that could be just kind of a little bit interesting They'll run with it. So they have something to say about it And in this case they literally were promoting and pushing for people to buy drugs Which is crazy to me to imagine that and that really impacts the way that people perceive the tour project and the tour network and What we're trying to do is not that particular thing that is a sort of side effect that occurs What we want is for every person to have the right to speak freely and the right to read anonymously on the internet and we also need to keep in mind the different incentive structures that they have. So BBC posted their first article about Silk Road and Tor, and the comment section was packed with, oh, wow, thanks. Oh, this is great. Oh, I don't have to go to the street corner and get shot. Oh, wow, thanks. This is great. Just comment after comment of people saying, thank you for telling me about this. And then a week later, they posted a follow-up article saying, and we bought some, and it was really good. <laughs> so... <laughs> What motivation are they doing here? And so their, their goal in this case is let's get more clicks. It doesn't matter what it takes, doesn't matter what we destroy while we're doing it. So that, that has some serious problems, obviously, because then there are different structures that exist to attack as part of the war on some drugs, and they want to show that their mission is, of course, impacted by Tor. They want to have an enemy that they can paint a target on. They want something sexy that they can get funding for. So here's a, here's a little funny uh, story about an agent, uh, as it says in the last point, who showed this massive drop in the Tor network load after Silk Road was busted, right? Because everybody realizes, of course, that all the anonymity traffic in the world must be for illicit things. So this was act at a particular meeting where they were trying to get more funding for this. This was a US government person who basically said, said, I evaluated the Tor network load at, during the Silk Road bust, and I saw a 50% network load drop when the Silk, when the Silk Road bust happened. So I, I started out with him arguing, oh, uh, actually, you know, when there's a huge amount of publicity about, I don't know if Tor is broken, we can understand. It would be reasonable that some Tor people would stop using Tor for a little while in order to wait for more facts to come out, and then we'll be more prepared for it. Uh, but then I thought, you know, wait a minute, we've got the Tor metrics database. We have all of this data of uh, load on the network. So then I went, well, let, let's go actually see if there was a 50% drop on the Tor network. 
So the green line here is the capacity of the Tor network over time. So the amount of bytes that relays can push uh, if we were loading it down completely. And the purple line is the number of bytes that are actually handled on the network over time. Can you guess? Where, where, if you don't look at the dates at the bottom, can you show what that agent was talking about? Or is the agent totally full of shit? <laughs> Just a hypothetical question, but if you have a th anyone, shout it out. Yeah, you in there? Nope. Oh, that, that's right, it didn't go down by 50%. <laughs> wow, he was completely wrong. But just for the record, that's where he said there was a drop. <laughs> and while we've taught you how to read these graphs, here's a graph of the overall network growth over the past three or four years. So the green line again is the amount of capacity, and we've seen a bunch of people adding fast relays recently after the Snowden uh, issues, and we'll talk a little bit later about uh, what other reasons people are running more capacity lately as the load on the network goes up. Okay, and then there is the dark web, or the deep web, or the whatever else the hell you call it web. Uh, and again, this comes back to media trying to produce as many articles as they can. So here, here's the basic, uh, I'll give you the, the primer on this dark web thing. Statement one. The dark web is every web page out there that Google can't index. That's the definition of the dark web. So, so every corporate database, every government database, every, everything that you access with a web browser at work or whatever, all those things that Google can't get to, that is the dark web. That's statement one. Statement two, 90 something percent of web pages are in the dark web. So these were both well-known facts a year ago. Statement three that the media has added this year, the only way to access the dark web is through Tor. <laughs> these three statements together sell more and more articles because it's great, people buy them, they're all shocked. Oh my God, the web is bigger than I thought and it's all because of Tor. <laughs> So really, the reality of this is that it's not actually the case. Obviously, that's a completely laughable thing. And for everyone that's here, not necessarily people watching on the video stream, but for everyone here, I think you realize how ridiculous that is. That entire setup is obviously a kind of uh, clickbait, if you would call it something like that. There are a few high-profile hidden services. I actually, just as a show of hands, raise your hand if you run a Tor hidden service. Right. So no one's ever heard of your Tor hidden service, almost certainly. And these are the ones that people have heard of. And this is something which is kind of a fascinating reality, which is that these, these four sites, or these four entities, have produced most of the stories related to the deep, gaping, whatever web that you want to call it, the dark web. And in fact, for the most part, it's been, I would say, uh, the top one, for example, with WikiLeaks, it's a positive example. And in fact, with Global Leaks, which is something that Arturo Falasto and a number of other really great Italian hackers here have been working on, with the Global Leaks, they're deploying more and more hidden services that you also haven't heard about for localized corruption, reporting, and whistleblowing. But the news doesn't report about Arturo's great work. The news reports on the farmer's market, on freedom hosting, and on Silk Road. And those things also bring out a disproportionate amount of incredible negative attention. In the case of freedom hosting, we have a developer, Mike Perry, who's kind of the most incredible evil genius alive today. I think he's probably at about two Mike Perrys right now, if that would be my guess. And he was relentlessly attacked because he happened to have a, a registration for a company which had um, an F and an H in the name. It wasn't actually even close to what's up there now. And he was relentlessly attacked because the topics that the other sites have as part of their customer base or as part of the things that they're pushing online, they really pull on people's hearts in a big way. And that sort of created a lot of stress. I mean, the, the first issue of WikiLeaks created a lot of stress for people working on Tor in various different ways. But for Mike Perry, he was personally targeted in a sort of co-intel pro style harassment and a really sad, and a really sad series of events. And of course, the news 
also picked up on that in some negative ways. And they really, really picked up on that. And that's a really big part of, I think you could call it a kind of culture conflict that we're in right now. The farmer's market has also quite an interesting story, which I think you wanted to tell. Yeah, so I actually uh, heard from a DEA person who was involved in the uh, eventual bust of the farmer's market story. So that uh, long ago, there was a website on the internet, and they sold drugs. Oh my god. And there were people who bought drugs from this website, and there, no tour, tour was nowhere in the story. It was some website in Southeast Asia, um, and the DEA wanted to take it down. Uh, so they, they learned, I mean, the website was public. It was a public web server. So they sent some sort of letter to the country that it was in, and the country that it was in said, screw you. And then they said, okay, well, I, I guess we can't take down the web server. So then they uh, started to try to investigate the, the people behind it. And it turns out the people behind it used hush mail. So they were happily communicating with each other very safely. Uh, so the folks in the US uh, sent a letter to Canada, uh, and then Canada made hush mail, uh, basically gives them the entire database of all the emails that these people had sent. Um, and then a year or two later, these people discovered Tor, and they're like, hey, we should switch our website over to Tor, and then it'll be safe. That sounds good. Uh, the DEA people were watching them the whole time, looking for a good time to bust them. Uh, and then they switched over to Tor, and then six months later was a good time to bust them. Uh, so then there were all these newspaper articles about how Tor hidden services are obviously broken. Uh, and the first time I heard this story, I was thinking to myself, uh, idiot drug sellers use PayPal, get busted. End of story. Uh, but they were actually using PayPal correctly. They, they had uh, innocent people around the world who were receiving PayPal payments and turning it into some uh, Panama-based e-currency or something. Uh, so the, the, the better lesson of the story is idiot drug sellers use hush mail, get busted. So there, there are a lot of different pieces of all of these. Don't use hush mail. Seriously, it's a bad idea. And don't use things where they have a habit of backdooring their service or cooperating with so-called lawful interception orders because it tells you that their system is not secure. And it's clear that hush mail falls into that category. They, they fundamentally have chosen that that is what they would like to do, and they should have that reputation, and we should respect them exactly as much as they deserve for that. So don't use their service if you can, especially if you're going to do this kind of stuff. Or maybe what I mean is, guys, do that. Use hush mail. But everybody else, protect yourself. So the thing is that not every single person is actually stupid enough to use hush mail. And so as a result, we have started to see some pretty crazy stuff happen, which we, of course, knew would happen, and we always understood that this would be a vector. So in this case, this year, we saw, I think, one of the probably not the most interesting exploits that we've ever seen, but one of the most interesting exploits we've ever seen deployed against a broad scale of users. And we're not exactly sure who was behind it, though there was an FBI person who went to court in Ireland and did, in fact, claim that they were behind it. The IP space that the exploit connected back to was either SAIC or NSA. And I had an, inter uh, I had an exchange with one of the guys behind the VuPen exploit company. And he has, on a couple of occasions, mentioned writing exploits for Tor browser. And what he really means is Firefox. And this is a serious problem, of course. If they want to target a person, though, first they have to actually find them. So traditionally, if you're not using Tor, they go to your house, they plug in some gear, they go to the ISP upstream, and they plug in some gear. Or they do some interception with an MC catcher and things like that. Most of these techniques I'll talk about on Monday with Claudio, um, if you're interested. Um, but basically, it's the same. They find out who you are, then they begin to target you, then they serve you an exploit. This year, one of the differences is that they had actually taken over a Tor hidden service and started to serve up an exploit from that, just trying to exploit every single person that visited the hidden service. So there was a period of time when you could really badly troll all of your friends by just putting a link up where it would load in an iframe and they would have been exploited if they were running an old version of Firefox and an old version of Tor browser which was an interesting twist. They didn't actually, as far as we know, use that exploit against anyone while it was a fresh zero day. But they did write it, and they did serve it up, and they gave the rest of the world the payload to use against whoever they'd like. So when the FBI did this, they basically gave an exploit against Firefox and Tor browser to the Syrian electronic army who couldn't have written one even if they wanted to. 
This is a really interesting difference between other ways that the FBI might try to bust you, where they can localize the damage of hitting untargeted people who are otherwise innocent, especially. But we've asked Firefox to try to integrate some of these privacy-related things that we've done. We'd like to be able to be more up to speed with Firefox. And they generally seem friendly to it. I think that's a fair, fair thing to say. But we have a desynchronization. But even with that desynchronization, we were still ahead of what they were doing, as far as we can tell. But they are actually at the point where they have hired probably some people from this community. <clears throat> Fuck you. And they write those exploits and serve them up. And so that is a new turn. We had not seen that before this year. And that's a really serious change. As a result, we've obviously been looking into Chrome, which has a very different architecture, and in some cases is significantly harder to exploit than Firefox. Even with just very straightforward bugs, which should be very easy to exploit, the Chrome team has done a good job. We want to have a lot of diversity in the different browsers, but we have a very strict set of requirements for protecting privacy with Tor Browser. And there's a whole design document up there. So just adding Tor and a web browser together is not quite enough. You need, you need some actual thoughts. Uh, that have been mostly by Mike Perry and Aaron Clark have been elucidated in the Tor browser design document. So we're hoping to work on that. If anyone here would like to work on that, that's really something where we really need some help because there is really only one Mike Perry, uh, literally and figuratively. OK, another exciting topic people have been talking about lately is the diversity of funding. A lot of our funding comes from governments, US mostly, but some other ones as well, uh, because they have things that they want us to work on. So once upon a time, uh, I, when I was looking at fundraising and how to get money, I, I would go to places and I would say, we've got 10 things we want to work on. If you want to fund one of these 10, you can help us set our priorities. We, we really want to work on uh, circumventing censorship. We really want to work on anonymity. We really want to work on Tor browser safety. So if you, can, if you have funding for one of these, then we'll focus on the one that you're uh, most interested in. So there are some trade-offs here. Uh, on the one hand, government funding is good because we can do more things. That's great. The, a lot of the stuff that you've seen from Tor over the past couple of years comes from people who are paid full time to be able to work on Tor and, and focus on it and not have to worry about where they're going to pay their rent or, or where they're going to get food. Uh, on the other hand, it's bad because uh, funders can influence our priorities. Now, there's no conspiracy. It's not that people come to us and say, here's money, do a backdoor, and so on. We're never going to put any backdoors in Tor ever. Maybe you could tell the story about that really uh, high-pitched lady who tried to get you to tell you that it was your duty, and then you explained. Give me a few more details. <laughs> People have approached us, obviously, in order to try to get us to do these types of things. And this is a serious commitment that the whole Tor community gets behind, which is that we will never, ever put in a back door. And any time that we can tell that something has gone wrong, we try to fix it as soon as is possible, regardless, actually, I would say for myself, of any other consequences, that our commitment to protecting anonymity of our user base extends beyond any reasonable commitment, actually. And we really believe that commitment. And there are people that have tried to get us to change that, tried to tell us that, oh, it's only because you're living in the free world and you're able to have a company that, and make a profit that you can even write this software. So come on, do your duty. Yeah. And of course, when we tell them we're a nonprofit and that we're not going to do it, they're completely dumbfounded, for example. Now I remember that discussion, yes. Yeah. <laughs> This was a discussion with a, a U.S. Department of Justice person uh, who basically said, "It's your the Congress has given us, the Department of Justice, the right to backdoor everything, and <clears throat> you have a tool that you haven't made easy for us to backdoor. So it's your responsibility to fix it so that we can use the privileges and rights given us by Congress on you know, surveilling everybody, and you are taking advantage of the situation that we've given you in America where you've got good freedom of speech and you've got other freedoms and so on. You're, you're, you're stealing from the country, you're cheating on the process by not giving us the back door that Congress said we should have. And then I said, actually, we're a nonprofit. We work for the public good. And then, then the conversation basically ended. She had no further thing to say. So part of what we need to do is continue to make tools that are actually safe as tools rather than a lot of the other systems out there. On the other hand, uh, a, 
every funder we've talked to lately has interesting priorities. They want to pay for censorship resistance. They want to pay for outreach, education, training, and so on. We don't have any funders right now who want to pay for better anonymity. And it's really important for some of the people we heard about in the last talk that they have really good anonymity against really large adversaries. And I'm not just talking about American intelligence agencies. There are a lot of intelligence agencies around the world who are trying to learn how to surveil everything. So what should Tor's role be? Here. There are a lot of people in the Tor development community who say what we really need to do is focus on writing good code and we'll let the rest of the world take care of itself. Um, there's also a trade-off from some of the funders we have right now where uh, I, I could go up and I could say a lot of really outrageous things that uh, I agree with and that you agree with, uh, but some of our funders might wonder uh, if they should keep funding us after that. So part of what we need to do is get some funders who are more comfortable with the messages that everybody here would like the world to hear. So if you know anybody who wants to help provide actual freedom, we'd love to hear from you. And it's important to understand that we sort of have an interesting place in the world at the moment where it's easy to say that we shouldn't be political and that in general there shouldn't be politics in what we're doing. And it's also easy to understand that that's crazy when someone says that to an extent because the idea of having free speech, having the right to read, having the ability to reach a website that is beyond the power of the state, that is a very political thing for many people. And it is often the privilege of some where they don't even realize that's a political statement. And they suggest and that they suggest that we don't need to be political. We need to recognize the political context that we exist in, and especially after the summer of Snowden, understanding that there are almost no tools that can resist the NSA and GCHQ, almost none. We did not survive completely in the summer of Snowden. They were able to get some Tor users, but they couldn't get all Tor users. That's really important. We changed the economic game for them, and that, fundamentally, is a political issue. But please note that the solution is not a partisan solution, where we say, well, some people are good and some are bad. You guys over there, on the left or on the right, you don't deserve to have freedom of speech. You don't have the right to read. We aren't saying that. We're saying that the common good of everyone having these fundamental rights protected in a practical way is an important thing for us to build and for all of us to contribute to and for every person to have. That is, I think, the best kind of political solution we can come up with. Though it is a very controversial one in some ways, I think that we can't actually do it unless everyone really starts to agree with us. And we are making a lot of positive change in this, as we saw with the network graph, but this comes from mutual aid and solidarity, which most of the people in this room provide. And that diversity of users is actually technically what makes Tor safe. You need to have activists in various countries and folks in Russia right now and law enforcement around the world. You need to have them all in the same network. Otherwise, if I see that you're using Tor, I can start guessing why you're using Tor. So we need that diversity of users, not just uh, for a perception perspective, but for an actual technical perspective. We need to have all the different uh, types of users out there blending into the same system so that they can keep each other safe. So part of the, the, the hobbies that each tour person has, uh, we're all uh, getting better at outreach to various communities. So um, I mentioned earlier that I talked to law enforcement uh, to try to teach them how these things work. Uh, it turns out that having Jake talk to law enforcement is not actually the most effective way to convince them of things. <laughs> So I'm, 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 yeah, you know, my lawyer gave me some great advice, which I can tell you without breaking the privilege of our other communications, but she says, never miss a chance to shut the fuck up. <laughs> and that, I think, really, really underscores why I should not talk to the police about why they also need traffic analysis resistance, reachability, network security, privacy, and anonymity. Roger's much, much more diplomatic. So at the same time, we have people talking uh, to domestic violence and abuse groups and teaching them how to be safe. 
And at the same time, we have folks at corporations learning how to be safe online. We hear from large companies who are saying, I want to uh, put the entire uh, corporate traffic over Tor because we actually do have adversaries and they actually are spying on us and they do want to learn what we're doing. So how do we become safe? from these situations. So part of what we need is help from all of you to become outreach for all of your communities and get better at teaching people about why privacy is important for the communities that you're talking to and learn how to use their language and convince them that these things are important and at the same time teach them about the other groups out there who care so that they can understand that it's a bigger issue than just whatever they're most focused on. Okay, so uh, a while ago I wrote up a list of three ways to destroy Tor. Um, the first way, which we've got, we have a handle on it for a while, the first way is change the laws or the policies or the cultures uh, so that anonymity is outlawed. And we're pretty good at fighting back in governments and policy and culture and so on and saying, no, no, there are, there are good uses of these things. You can't uh, take them away from the world. The second way, make ISPs hate hosting exit relays. And if more and more ISPs say, no, I'm not going to do that, then eventually the Tor network shrinks, reducing the anonymity it can provide because there's not as much diversity of where you might pop out of the Tor network to go to the websites. So I think we're doing pretty well at fighting that fight. Uh, we've known about it for a while. It's one we've been focusing on for a long time. Torservers.net and a lot of other groups are doing great work at building and maintaining relationships with ISPs. Um, but the third one is one that we haven't focused on as much as we should, which is make websites hate Tor users. So a growing number of places are just refusing to hear from Tor users at all. Uh, Wikipedia did it a long time ago. Google gives you a CAPTCHA if you're lucky. That's the best question ever. I feel like that's a good setup. I will cover this one next. Um, so. Skype is another interesting example here. If you run a Tor exit relay and you try to Skype with somebody, Microsoft hangs up on you. And the reason for that is not that they say, oh my god, Tor people are, are abusing Skype. Microsoft pays some commercial company out there to give them a blacklist. They don't even know what's on it. And the company puts Tor exit IPs on it. And now Microsoft blacklists all the Tor exit relays. And they don't even know they're doing it. They don't even care. So as more and more of these blacklisting companies uh, exist, we're more and more screwed. So and we need help trying to uh, learn how to teach all of these companies how to accept users without thinking that IP addresses are the right way to identify people. There might also be, on point three, a relationship here with some of the other points here, for example, point four, which is to say that when a company does not want to give you location anonymity, maybe there's a reason for that. I mean, <clears throat> I personally think that Wikipedia is great. I don't feel so great about Yelp and about Google most of the time, and I definitely don't feel good about Skype. Given what we've learned, it makes sense that they would demonstrate that they do not respect you as users and the Tor network as a way to protect users from them, actually. And some of these places will say that it's basically only being used for abuse. Often they won't have metrics for it, and they will refuse to work with us to come up with inventive solutions, like, for example, something where you have to use a, a NIM system of some kind in the case of Wikipedia, or something where you solve a CAPTCHA, something where you have to have an account, something where you're pseudonymous, but you get to retain location privacy. And in, in, actually, in a few cases, it's probably better that Tor is blocked because they don't even provide secure logins when you're not using Tor. So it's not necessarily always a good thing to use the services anyway. So in a sort of funny sense, it could be helpful that they're blocking Tor. But we would like to improve those things. And one thing is to show that we need to build some systems to get these properties. And we need to show that it is the best thing right now that we all can use. And we need people that are working with these companies, with these communities, to actually help us to understand how we can better serve a Tor community, but also the Tor community that overlaps with their community, especially Wikipedia. For me personally, it kills me that the way that I get to edit the Wikipedia, should I edit it, is that I have to send an email to someone, tell them an account I already have, ask them to set a special flag in the Wikipedia database, and then I can log in and edit. 
That's not really the ideal solution, I think. If I'm not being abusive on Wikipedia, I should be able to have a pseudonymous way to edit, I should be able to anonymously connect, and I should be able to do that from anywhere in the world, especially when the local network is censoring me and my only way to get to the Wikipedia is to, in fact, use Tor, or something like it. <laughs> so, the last point on that is this one. What was the joke that George made? Yeah, so I, I, was showing this to, I was showing this to an anonymity researcher and he started yelling, IPO, 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 <laughs> as soon as he saw this graph of Tor users over time. So in the course of a week or so, we added about four or five million Tor clients to the network. And you would think, oh wow, the Snowden thing worked, it's great. But actually, some jerk in the Ukraine signed up his five million node botnet. I mean, one of the good things about this is that we learned that the Tor network scales to more than 5 million users. We've been working on scalability, it worked. We had to make some changes. There's, for example, the uh, NTOR handshaking, which is using elliptic curves. That is something which really helped to reduce the load on the relays. This is a, a pretty big change. but. There is a lot of work that Mike Perry has done with load balancing, lots of work by Nick Mathewson, lots of changes to the Tor network for, for scalability. But if this had been like a real attacker, if the botnet had been turned against the Tor network, it probably would have been fatal, I think. A In really interesting detail is that this was a botnet for Windows. And Microsoft has the ability to remove things that they flag as malicious. And so they were going around and removing Tor clients from Microsoft Windows users that were a part of this botnet. Now, when we talked with them, my understanding is that they only removed it when they were certain that it was a Tor that came from this botnet. They That's actually, a lot of power that Microsoft has there, though. If you're using Windows trying to be anonymous, word to the wise, bad idea. They actually removed the bot and left the Tor client because they weren't sure whether they should remove it. So actually, all of those five millions are still running Tor clients. Whoops. <laughs> so interesting point here, Summer of Snowden, it's hard to tell. Some, you know, there's some pieces of information that we're really missing here. Due to the botnet happening at the same time, it's really difficult to understand the public response to the revelations about NSA spying, especially now. I mean, we think that most of that is botnet traffic, over a million, over the million, where it goes up, over almost to six million. So that's a, that's a serious amount of traffic from that botnet. And that is a really serious threat to the Tor network. It can be alleviated a couple of different ways. One of these things I mentioned before, NTOR handshake, but another thing is if every person in this room were to run a TOR relay, even a middle relay, not an exit relay, um, it would make it significantly harder to melt the TOR network. I actually think that would be incredible if you guys would all do that. I don't think that all of you will, but if you did, that would make it so that we could survive other events like this in the future. So someone sent a question, which we're just going to go ahead and answer now. When talking of funding for better anonymity, what do you think in terms of money? How much could you need? Well, here's the thing. If you were willing to fund us, we would really like you, or I would really like it, especially since I'm probably the one that threatens the US government funding of Tor more than any person in this room. Um, I think that it would be great if you could match the dollar to dollar that government funders bring to the table. We would really like that. It would be amazing if that was possible. Um, so there's actually a hard number on the website. Or if you wanted to, as much money as you have. Feel free. Either way, <laughs> To give you us. a sense of, of scale, uh, right now our 2014 budget is looking like it will be somewhere between 2 million US and 3 million US, which is great, except we're trying to do so many different things at once. If it ends up on the 2 million US side, uh, we basically have no funding for making anonymity better. Uh, if it ends up more than that, then we're in better shape and we can make people more safe. And part of the thing is that we have to build all sorts of tools that are not directly related to Tor in many cases, especially because of the funding, but because we want users to be able to actually use the software with something else. It's not merely enough to have a Tor. You need to be able to do something with a Tor. You know? And that's, that's a really difficult part. But if there are specific things, we would also be open to alternate funding models where we fund very specific tasks, for example. That would be a really great thing. We haven't really experimented with that. Um, but on that note, I wanted to talk about classified information. Everybody ready? It's 
It's not classified anymore, it's on the internet? I'm not sure. Um, so this is probably the hot topic, I would say. The, probably the one everyone wanted to know about. So the NSA and the GCHQ have decided that they don't like anonymity, and they're doing everything that they possibly can to attack it, with a few exceptions. Um, so there are a few different programs. I'm going to talk a lot about this on Monday, so I don't want to go into too much detail about the non-Tor aspects of it. But for the Tor side of it, Quick Ant is what's called a question-filled data set. Um, this is a QFD. What that means is it's TLS-related sessions, as I understand it, and it is recording data, that is, data retention about TLS sessions. It's pulled from a larger thing, Flying Pig, which was revealed on, I think, a Brazilian television clip where someone photographed a moving picture of Glenn's screen. Um, that program is kind of scary, but not too scary. It just looks like after-the-fact data retention. Quantum Insert, on the other hand, is a pretty straightforward man-on-the-side attack Fox Acid, which is another thing which we know they've used against Tor users, is basically just um, the tailored access and operations web server farm where they serve up malware, sort of like a watering hole attack, except in this case, they also combine it with quantum insert so that when you visit your Yahoo mail, NSA and GCHQ love Yahoo, um, when you, even with you, when you use Tor, they basically redirect you by just tagging in a little bit of data into the TCP connection. And it, of course, Tor does its job. It flows all the way back to you. Your web browser then loads it. You're now connected to their server. Their server delivers malicious code. And they use this to pop somebody. From what I understand, it took them eight months to hit one guy. That's fucking great, I think, that we went from everybody all the time being compromisable to they have to very carefully pick one person and work for a long time, they really believe that that's the right target. They really understand that that is someone that they want to go after. And if that person were to keep their browser up to date, they probably would have been ahead of the game. Not exactly sure. But there are some other things that are really dangerous, which is Quantum Cookie, for example. Quantum Cookie is a program where basically they're able to elicit from a connection other um, connections from your web browser, which will get you to leak cookie information. So let's say you happen to log into a Yahoo account, and that was a known selector for surveillance, and then they thought you might also have a Gmail cookie that wasn't marked secure, and you might also have uh, another search engine, or you might have some other cookies, then they would basically insert things that your browser will then request insecurely over the same connection. They'll tie them together, correlate that, and then they will extract it, and they'll be able to tell that this selector is linked to these other selectors, because they've basically been able to actively probe. A solution to that is HTTPS Everywhere, which we already ship in the Tor Browser Bundle, but also to be aware about session isolation, to maybe, even if you are using things where you're trying to do it as securely as possible, not every site will offer TLS, to actually make sure that the Tor Browser only has the exact set of credentials you need for the thing you're doing at that time. So that's incredibly straightforward stuff. In, in terms of the hacker community, this is like not even really interesting, actually. The thing that makes it interesting is that they do it at internet scale, and that they're trying to watch the entire internet all the time. Another interesting fact about this is that you would imagine that not routing through the Five Eyes countries would make you safer in some way. I don't think that's actually true. From what I can tell, they actually have some restrictions if you route through the Five Eyes countries. And if you are not in a Five Eyes country, like Germany, they have no restrictions. So if you behave differently, we know from an anonymity perspective that that's worse for you. And if you behave differently in this particular way, then there are legal answers that show that you shouldn't break out from the regular way that Tor users and Tor clients behave. But a key point to take home is that every single person here has the same set of problems if they're not using Tor, and it is easier for them. So that's a huge, huge difference. And the last point, I think, is a key, a key one, which Roger has a great story for. Yeah, so, they, so the, the story here is they look at Tor traffic coming out of Tor exit relays. They don't know who the person is, and they have to make a decision there. Do I try the quantum insert and the Fox Acid? Do I try to break into their browser, or do I leave them alone? And when they see the Tor flow, they don't know who it is. So on the one hand, that's great. They can't do targeted attacks. They have to do broad attacks and then check wait later to see whether they broke into the right person. 
But as soon as the Guardian articles went up about this, uh, DNI, the something national intelligence, put out a press release saying, we'd like to assure everybody that we never attack Americans. So first of all, on behalf of the American people and the US government, which I do not represent, I'm so sorry that my country keeps embarrassing the rest of the reasonable Americans, of which there are plenty, many of us, that are not James Clapper, that total fucking asshole. <clears throat> we have five minutes. So the reason why that story is particularly interesting is that I, I talked to an actual NSA person a couple weeks ago, and I'm like, wait, you never attack Americans, but you have to blanket attack everybody and then find out who it was. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. We, we watch them log into Facebook, and if they log in as the user we're trying to attack, then we attack them. No problem. And they do the blanket dragnet surveillance. So an interesting point, of course, is that we've always heard, I, I, I once met someone who explained to me, the NSA obviously runs lots of tornodes. Like they run like 90,000 tornodes, I think was the number. I wish we had 90,000 tornodes, that'd be incredible. You know, we're like, what, at about four or 5,000 at any given point in time that are stable, of which one third are exit relays, right? So it turns out when the NSA did run some, they ran half a dozen, a dozen? They on, ran about 10, yeah. and they were small and short-lived on EC2. But that should not make you happy. It doesn't matter whether the NSA runs Tor relays. They can watch your Tor relays. If you run a Tor relay at a great place in anywhere in the US or Germany or whatever they're good at spying on, they watch the upstream of your relay and they get almost what they would get from running their own relay. So what we should be worried about, we should not be worried that they're running relays. This is it's a concern, but the bigger concern is that they're watching the whole internet, and the internet is much more centralized than we think it is. There are a lot more bottlenecks where if you watch them, you get to see a lot of different tour traffic. So the, the, the problem is not so much are they running relays as uh, how many normal relays can they watch. And if you're thinking about a large adversary like NSA, the answer could be a third, half. We don't know how many deals they have. So an interesting point here is that one-hop proxies are, or VPN, who here uses a VPN to some kind of commercial VPN service? Right. So this is a pretty big problem, I think, which is that you end up with the hide my ass problem, which is that, first of all, that company, it's a problem. Second of all, what they do to their users is also a problem, which is that they basically promote their service for revolution in Egypt, for example, but when someone used it because they disagreed with the policies of the United Kingdom, then they turn them over. Interesting point. We need to build decentralized systems where they can't make that choice. We need to make sure that that isn't actually happening. And one of the things that we are trying to drive home is that, and I really think it's important to, to, to take this to heart, one-hop proxies or VPNs, as we have said for more than a decade, are not safe. Especially if you think about when they, um, from the quick ants and from the flying pig stuff, they're, they're recording traffic information about connections. And in some cases, we know, thanks to Laura Poitras and James Risen, that they have data retention, which is something like, what is it, 10, 15 years? Five years online, 10 years offline? Is that right? Right, OK. <clears throat> That's bad news. We know that the math for VPNs is not in your favor. So that said, what happens with this stuff, right? What happens is what happened, for example, with the Silk Road fellow. Or maybe not. It's not clear. It could be that the guy used a VPN, which is brain dead, but it could also be that the NSA has this data and tried to pull off a retroactive attack once they already had him from other things, like ordering fake IDs. We don't know which in the case of Silk Road, but we can tell you that it's pretty clearly a bad idea to do it if you're going to do something interesting. It's probably also a bad idea to do it just generally, because you don't even know what interesting is in five or 10 years. So parallel construction is a really serious problem, and we think probably if we could expand the Tor network, it would make it significantly harder to do this. It would make it significantly harder for them to do it, especially if you replace your VPN with Tor. There are some trade-offs with that, though. So the real question is what your threat model is, and you really have to think about it, and then also understand that we live in a world now where law enforcement and intelligence services, they seem to be blending together, and they seem to be blending together across the whole planet in secret which is a serious problem for the threat model of Tor. So I actually talked to some FBI people and I said, so which one of these is it? 
And they said, well, we, we never get tips from the NSA. That we're good, honest law enforcement. They're doing something bad, but why should that affect us? And my response was, well, NSA says they told you. So who's li are you lying to me, or are they lying to you, or what's going on here? Uh, and I don't actually know the right solution here. So c scenario one, the NSA uh, anonymously tips the FBI, and they go check something out, and they say, well, I need to build a case, so they do. Scenario two, some anonymous whistleblower tips off the FBI, and they go build a case. From the FBI's perspective, these are the same. I got a tip, I built a case. What, why should I care where it came from? Uh, and so should we build a know your customer law so that the FBI has to know their uh, informers or whistleblowers? Uh, should we rely on the NSA to regulate itself? Should we rely on the Congress to regulate NSA? None of these are good answers. So we have a very limited amount of time and in order to be able to address some questions, um, we will probably skip a few things and we'll put these slides online. But short quick summaries for a few of these slides so we can address some questions. One of them is that we want to improve hidden services. Even though they haven't been broken as far as we understand from any of the documents that have been released, we still want to make them stronger because we want to be ahead of the game. We and don't want to play catch up. We especially need to improve the usability and performance of them because right now they're a toy that only really dedicated people get working and the more mainstream we can make them, the more broad uses we're going to see. The reason why people keep hearing about high profile bad hidden services is that we don't have enough good use cases in action yet that lots of people are experiencing. The most important thing for all of the, let's say, cypherpunks movement to understand is that when you have usable crypto, you are doing the right thing. When you have strong peer-reviewed free software to implement that, and it's built on a platform where you can look at the whole stack, you're really ahead of the game. There's a lot to be done in that, and if we do that for hidden services, I think we'll have similar returns that you'll see with other crypto projects. So one of the other great things in the Tor world is the number of researchers who are doing great work at evaluating and improving Tor's anonymity. So there are a couple of papers that were out over the past year uh, talking about uh, how uh, we didn't actually choose the right guard rotation parameters. I'm not going to get into that in detail in our last couple of minutes, uh, but the, the very brief version is uh, if you can attack both sides of the network uh, and they run 10% of the network, they, the adversary, run 10% of the network, the chance over time, the blue line is the current situation where you choose three first tops, three entry guards, and you rotate every couple of months. Over time, the chance that you get screwed by an adversary who runs 10% of the network is pretty high. But if we change it to one guard and you don't rotate, then we're at the green line, which is a lot better against an adversary who's really quite large. This is an adversary larger than torservers.net, for example. So a, a, a Morris pretty- is no adversary, right? Yep. So a, a pretty large uh, attacker, we need to move it from the blue line down to the green line. And that, that's an example of the anonymity work that we need to do. So what's next? Tor, endorsed by Egyptian activists, WikiLeaks, NSA, GCHQ, Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden. Uh, different communities like Tor for different reasons. Uh, some of our funders, we go to them with that sentence. Uh, basically, everybody we go to with that sentence is like, well, I like those three examples, but I don't like those two examples. So part of what we need to do is, is help them to understand uh, why all of these different examples matter. That said, I tend to believe that we need to be engaged in a pretty big way. And thanks to the people of Ecuador, especially the people running the Minga Tech community events, they have actually put together um, a real model, which should be emulated probably by the rest of the world, where they really engage with civil society, and they're actually able to arrange for meetings with, for example, the foreign minister, or with various other people involved in the National Assembly. And as a result, they had uh, Article 474, which they proposed, which was basically the worst data retention law you can imagine, it included you know, videotaping in internet cafes, uh, six-month dragnet surveillance, all sorts of awful stuff. And they were able to, in the course of, I would say, three to six months, this is mostly the Flock Society, actually, um, they were able to organize a real discussion about this, and we were able to get this proposed part of the penal code completely removed uh, at the end of November of last year, early December or of this year, uh, so just about a month ago. So if we really work together across the spectrum, we 
see right now in Ecuador, for example, changing away by showing them that fundamentally the game is rigged. If you choose to spy on your citizens, then the NSA always wins. And the NSA wants people to believe that everybody's doing the spying. So one of the things I explain to people in the Ecuadorian government and in Ecuadorian civil society is that you can choose a different game. You can choose not to play that game. The only people that win when you choose that game are the NSA and potentially you a few times. But the NSA will get whatever data you have stored away. If you want to be secure against the dragnet surveillance, if you want to be secure against people who will break into that system, you must not have that system in existence. You must choose a different paradigm. And when I told this to people in Ecuador, and they understood the trade-offs, and they understood that they are not the best at surveilling the whole planet, they understood that they're not the best at internet security yet, they realized that the game was rigged, and they got rid of Article 474 from the penal code, and there is no data retention there okay. in that penal code now. <laughs> But I have to stress, this is not because of one or two or ten people. It's because of a broad civil society movement, which is what we've also seen in Germany and in other places. So this is something which you should have a lot of hope about. It's not actually dark everywhere. We are actually making positive steps forward. So there are other tools that we would like help with. For example, Tails is a live CD. Uh, Wynon and other approaches are trying to add VM to it so that even if you can break out of the browser, there's something else you have to break out, other sandboxes. Uh, and there are a lot of other crypto improvements that we are happy to talk about afterwards. The Tor browser bundle, the new one, has a bunch of really interesting features. Deterministic builds is one of the coolest parts of it, where everybody here can build the Tor browser bundle and end up with an identical binary so that you can check to see that it really is the same one. Um, and here's a screenshot of the new one. It no longer has Vidalia in it. It's all just a browser with a Firefox extension that has a Tor binary and starts it. So we're trying to streamline it and make it a lot simpler and safer. Uh, I'd love to chat with you afterwards about the core Tor things that we're up to uh, in terms of building the actual program called Tor, but also the browser bundle and metrics and censorship resistance and so on. And then as a final note, uh, we accept Bitcoin now, um, which is great. To all of the Bitcoin millionaires in this community, we would really encourage you to help us get off of the U.S. government funding. Don't just complain. Help us. Mutual aid and solidarity means exactly that, to put some money where your mouth is. We would really like to do that. And it's really important to show people that we have alternative methods of funding community-based projects. So think about it. And you can, if you'd like, use Bitcoin. Alas, right now, BitPay is limiting you to $1,000 of Bitcoin per donation. Uh, we're hoping to lift that in the next couple of days, but if you would like to give us uh, lots of Bitcoins, uh, please don't get discouraged. And then, as a final note, starting right now in Noisy Square is a, an event on how to help Tor, and there will be a lot of Tor people there, and we'd love to help uh, teach you and answer your questions and help you become part of the community. We need you to teach other people why Torah is important. Thank you.